All right, so we're back with the one and only Ivan. Yesterday we read the first 25, not yesterday, sorry, a couple days ago, we read the first 25 pages. And I have to say already, the tone or mood of this book, it, I'm very sad for Ivan. Um, it makes me sad that he just is living in this place in the mall and his life doesn't seem that exciting right now, right? It's kind of boring and it's kind of lonely. So um, even though he's got some friends there, like the elephant, can't remember her name off the top of my head, but even though he's got these friends, it just, it's just kind of lonely. All right, The Nature Show. I have been in my domain for 9,855 days alone. Okay, so that's just solidifying the fact that this mood of the book is that he is kind of sad and lonely. For a while, when I was young and foolish, I thought I was the last gorilla on earth. I tried not to dwell on it. Still, it's hard to stay upbeat when you think there are no more of you. Then, one night after I watched a movie about men in black hats with guns and feeble-minded horses, a different show came on. It was not a cartoon, not a romance, not a western. I saw a lush florist, forest, sorry. I heard birds murmuring. The grass moved. The trees rustled. Then I saw him. He was a bit threadbare and scrawny and not as good looking as I am, to be honest. But sure enough, he was a gorilla. As suddenly as he appeared, the gorilla vanished and in his place was a scruffy white animal I called. I learned a polar bear and then a chubby water creature called a manatee and then another animal and another. All night I sat wondering, wondering about the gorilla I'd glimpsed. Where did he live? Would he ever come to visit? If there was a he somewhere, could there be a she as well? Or was it just the two of us all in this world trapped in our own separate boxes? Stella. I think that's the elephant's name now. Stella says she is sure I will see another real live gorilla someday. And I believe her because she is even older than I am and has eyes like black stars and knows more than I will ever know. Stella is a mountain. Mm, I was wrong. Next to her, I am a rock. Uh, oh. Oh, that was confusing to me. He's describing her size. Stella is a mountain. Next to her, I am a rock. And Bob is a grain of sand. Every night when the stores close and the moon washes the world with milky light, Stella and I talk. We don't have much in common, but we have enough. We are huge and alone, and we both love yogurt raisins. Sometimes Stella tells stories of her childhood, of leafy canopies hidden by mist and the busy songs of flowing water. Unlike me, she recalls every detail of her past. Elephants are known to have really good memories. Stella loves the moon with its untroubled smile. I love the feel of the sun on my belly. She says, it is quite a belly, my friend. And I say, thank you. And so is yours. We talk, but not too much. Elephants, like gorillas, do not waste words. Stella used to perform in a large and famous circus. And she still does some of those tricks for our show. During one stunt, Stella stands on her hind legs with Snickers jump, while Snickers jumps on her head. It's hard to stand on your hind legs when you weigh more than 40 men. If you are a curious elephant and you stand on your hind legs while a dog jumps on your head, you get a treat. If you do not, the claw stick comes swinging. Elephant hide is thick as bark on an ancient tree, but a claw stick can pierce it like a leaf. Once Stella saw a trainer hit a bull elephant with a claw stick. A bull is like a silverback, noble, contained, calm like a cobra is calm. When the claw stick caught in the bull's flesh, he tossed the trainer into the air with his tusk. The man flew, Stella said, like an ugly bird. She never saw the bull again. Stella's trunk. Stella's trunk is a miracle. She can pick up a single peanut with elegant precision, tickle a passing mouse, tap the shoulder of a, do a dozing keeper. 
Her trunk is remarkable, but still it can't unlatch the door of her tumble down domain. Circling Stella's legs are long ago scars from the chains she wore as a youth. Her bracelets, she calls them, when she worked at the famous circus. Stella had to balance on a pedestal for her most difficult trick. One day she fell off and injured her foot. When she went lame and lagged behind the other elephants, the circus sold her to Mac. Stella's foot never healed completely. She limps when she walks, and sometimes her foot gets infected when she stands in one place for too long. Last winter, Stella's foot swelled to twice its normal size. She had a fever, and she lay on the damp, cold floor of her domain for five days. They were very long days. Even now, I'm not sure she's completely better. She never complains, though, so it's hard to know. At the big top mall, no one bothers with iron shackles. A bristly rope tied to a bolt in the floor is all that's required. They think I'm too old to cause trouble, Stella says. Old age, she says, is a powerful disguise. So I'm, I just reread that paragraph where it says, at the big top mall, no one bothers with iron shackles. A bristly rope tied to a bolt in the floor is all that's required. So I guess it kind of is giving the idea that maybe they're tied up. A plan. It's been two days since anyone's come to visit. Mac is in a bad mood. He says we are losing money hand over fist. He says he's going to sell the whole lot of us. When Thelma, a blue and yellow macaw, demands, kiss me, big boy, for the third time in 10 minutes, Mac throws a soda can at her. Thelma's wings are clipped so that she can't fly, but she can still hop. She leaps aside just in the nick of time. Pucker up, she says with a shrill whistle. Max stomps to his office and slams the door shut. I wonder if my visitors have grown tired of me. Maybe if I learn a trick or two, it will help. Humans do seem to enjoy watching me eat. Luckily, I'm always hungry. I am a gifted eater. A silverback may, must eat 45 pounds of food a day if he wants to stay a silverback. 45 pounds of fruit and leaves and seeds and stems and bark and vines and rotten wood. Also, I enjoy the occasional insect. I am going to try to eat more. Maybe then we will get more visitors. Tomorrow I will eat 50 pounds of food, maybe even 55. That should make Mac happy. Do you think that'll make Mac happy if he's losing money? <laughs> he probably doesn't want to give him more food. That'll cost him more money, huh? Bob. I explained my plan to Bob. Ivan, he says, trust me on this one. The problem is not your appetite. He hops onto my chest and licks my chin, checking for leftovers. Bob is a stray, which means he does not have a permanent address. He is so speedy, so wily, that mall workers long ago gave up trying to catch him. Bob can sneak into cracks and crevices like a tracked rat. He lives well off the ends of hot, dog, of hot dogs he pulls from the trash. For dessert, he laps up spilled lemonade and splattered ice cream cones. I've tried to share my food with Bob, but he is a picky eater and says he prefers to hunt for himself. Bob is tiny, wiry, and fast, like a barking squirrel. He is nut-colored and big-eared. His, like, his tail moves like weeds in the wind, spiraling, dancing. Bob's tail makes me dizzy and confused. It has meanings within meanings, like human words. I am sad, it says. I am happy, it says. Beware, I may be tiny, but my teeth are sharp. Gorillas don't have any use for tails. Our feelings are uncomplicated. Our rumps are unadorned. Bob used to have three brothers and two sisters. Humans tossed them out of a truck onto the freeway and they, when they were a few weeks old. Bob rolled into a ditch. The others did not. Oh, the story is so sad. <laughs> Oh, I'm pretty sure that Mrs. Muller's going to be crying at some point in the story. Morning. His first night on the highway, Bob slept in the icy mud of the ditch. When he woke, he was so cold that his legs would not bend for an hour. Aw, Bob. The next night, Bob slept under some dirty hay near the big top mall garage bins. 
The following night, Bob found the spot in the corner of my domain where the glass is broken. I dreamed that I'd eaten a furry donut when I, and when I woke in the dark, I discovered a tiny puppy snoring on top of my belly. It had been so long since I'd felt the comfort of an, another's warmth that I wasn't sure what to do. Not that I hadn't had visitors. Mac had been in my domain, of course, and many other keepers. I'd seen my share of the rats zip past, and the occasional wayward sparrow had fluttered in through a hole in the ceiling. But they never stayed long. I didn't move all night for fear of waking Bob. Wild. Once I asked Bob why he didn't want a home. Humans, I'd noticed, seemed to be irrationally fond of dogs, and I could see why a puppy would be easier to cuddle with than, say, a gorilla. Everywhere in my home, Bob answered, I am a wild beast, my friend, untamed and undaunted. I told Bob he could work in the shows like Snickers, the poodle who rides Stella. Bob said Snickers sleeps on a pillow on a pink pillow in Mac's office. He said she eats foul smelling meat from a can. He made a face, his lips curled, revealing tiny needles of teeth. Poodles, he said, are parasites. Picasso. Mac gives me a fresh crayon, a yellow one, and ten pieces of paper. Time to earn your keep, Picasso, he mutters. I wonder who this Picasso is. Does he have a tire swing like me? Does he ever does he ever eat his crayons? I know I have lost my magic, so I try my very best. I clutch the crayon and think. I can scan my domain. What is yellow? A banana. I draw a banana. The paper tears but only a little. I lean back and Mac picks up the drawing. Another day, another scribble, he says. One down, nine to go. What else is yellow, I wonder, scanning my domain. I draw another banana. And then I draw eight more. <laughs> Three visitors. Three visitors are here. A woman, a boy, a girl. I strut across my domain for them. I dangle from my tire swing. I eat three banana peels in a row. The boy spits at my window. The girl throws a handful of pebbles. Sometimes I'm glad the glass is there. My visitors return. After the show, the spit pebble children come back. I display my impressive teeth. I splash in my filthy pool. I grunt and hoot. I eat and eat and eat some more. The children pound their pathetic chest. They toss more pebbles. Slimy chimps, I mutter. I throw a me ball at them. Sometimes I wish the glass were not there. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry I called those children sm slimy chimps. My mother would be ashamed of me. Remember in the glossary? Um, slimy chimps was a way that he described how humans look, I think. It's offensive, it's a human, and it refers to the sweat on hairless skin that we look slimy. Julia, like the spit pebble children, Julia is a child, but that, after all, is not her fault. While her father, George, cleans the mall each night, Julia sits by my domain. She could sit anywhere she wants, by the carousel, in the empty food court, on the bleachers coated in sawdust, but I'm not bragging when I say that she always chooses to sit with me. I think it's because we both love to draw. Sarah, Julia's mother, used to help clean the mall, but when she got sick and grew pale and stopped and stooped, Sarah stopped coming. Every night, Julia offers to help George, and every night, he says firmly, homework, Julia. The floors will just get dirty again. Homework, I have discovered, involves a sharp pencil and thick books and long sighs. I enjoy chewing pencils. I am sure I would excel at homework. <laughs> sometimes Julia dozes off, and sometimes she reads her books, but mostly she draws pictures and talks about her day. I don't know why people talk to me, but they often do. Perhaps it's because they think I can't understand them, or perhaps it's because I can't talk back. Julia likes science and art. She doesn't like Lila Burpee, who teases her because her clothes are old, and she does like Deshaun Williams, who teases her too, but in a nice way, and she would like to be a famous artist when she grows up. Sometimes Julia draws me, 
I am an elegant fellow in her pictures with my silver back gleaming like moon on moss and never look angry. The way I do on the fading billboard by the highway. I always look a bit sad though. There's that mood again. Drawing Bob. I love Julia's pictures of Bob. She draws him flying across the page, a blur of feet and fur. She draws him motionless, peeking out from behind a trash can or the soft hill of my belly. Sometimes in her drawings, Julia gives Bob wings or a lion's mane. Once she gave him a tortoise shell. But the best thing she ever gave him wasn't a drawing. Julia gave Bob his name. For a long time, no one knew what to call Bob. Now and then a mall worker would try to approach him with a tidbit. Here, doggy, they'd call, holding out a french fry. Come on, pooch, they'd say. How about a little piece of sandwich? But he would always vanish into the shadows before anyone could get too close. One afternoon, Julia decided to draw the little dog curled up in the corner of my domain. First, she watched him for a long time, chewing on her thumbnail. I could tell she was looking at him the way an artist looks at the world when she's trying to understand it. Finally, she grabbed her pencil and set to work. When she was finished, she held up the page. There he was, the tiny, big-eared dog. He was smart and cunning, but his gaze was wistful. Under the picture were three bold, confident marks circled in black. I was pretty certain it was a word, even though I couldn't read it. Julia's father peered over her shoulder. That's him exactly, he said, nodding. He pointed to the circled marks. I didn't realize his name was Bob, he said. Me either, said Julia. She smiled. I had to draw him first. Bob and Julia. Bob will not let humans touch him. He says their scent upsets his digestion. But every now and then I see him sitting at Julia's feet. Her fingers move gently just behind his right ear. See him right there? Mac. Usually Mac leaves after the last show, but tonight he is in his office working late. When he's done, he stops by my domain and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. George joins him, broom in hand, and Mac says the things he always says. How about that game last night? And business has been slow, but it'll get better. You'll see. And don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over the picture, over at the picture Julia is drawing. What are you making? He asks. It's for my mom, Julia says. It's a flying dog. She holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes and dogs. Hmm, Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing anyway? About the same, George says. She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Max says. Max starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Max says with a shrug. Buy the kids some more crayons. Mac is already out the door before George can yell, Thanks. Not sleepy. Stella, I say after Julie and her father go home. I can't sleep. Of course you can, she says. You are the king of sleepers. Shh, Bob says from his perch on my belly. I'm dreaming about chili fries. I'm tired, I say, but I'm not sleepy. What are you tired of, Stella asks. I think for a while. It's hard to put into words. Gorillas are not complainers or dreamers, poets, philosophers, nap takers. I don't know exactly. I kick at my tire swing. I think I may be a little tired of my domain. That's because it's a cage, Bob tells me. Bob is not always tactful. I know, Stella says. It's a very small domain. And you're a very big gorilla, Bob adds. Stella, I ask. Yes? I noticed you were limping more than usual today. Is your leg bothering you? Just a little, Stella answers. I sigh. Bob resettles. His ears flick. He drools a bit. But I don't mind. I'm used to it. Try eating something, Stella says. That always makes you happy. I eat an old brown carrot. Ew. It doesn't help, but I don't tell Stella. She needs to sleep. 
You could try remembering a good day, Stella suggests. That's what I do when I can't sleep. Stella remembers every moment since she was born. Every scent, every sunset, every slight, every, every victory. You know I can't remember much, I say. There's a difference, Stella says gently, between can't remember and won't remember. That's true, I admit. Not remembering can be difficult, but I've had a lot of time to work on it. Memories are precious, Stella adds. They help tell us who we are. Try remembering all your keepers. You always liked Carl, the one with the harmonica. Carl, yes. I remember how he gave me a coconut when I was still a juvenile. It took me all day to open it. I try to recall other keepers I have known. The humans who cleaned my domain and prepared my food and sometimes kept me company. There was Juan, who poured Pepsis into my, wa into my waiting mouth, and Katrina, who used to poke me with a broom when I was sleeping, and Ellen, who sang, How much is that monkey in the window? with a sad smile while she scrubbed my water bowl. And there was Gerald, who once brought me a box of fat, sweet strawberries. Gerald was my favorite keeper. I haven't had a real keeper in a long time. Max says he doesn't have the money to pay for an ape babysitter. These days, George cleans my cage, and Mac is the one who feeds me. When I think about all the people who have taken care of me, mostly it's Mac, I recall. Day in and day out, year after year after year. Mac, who brought me and raised me, and says I'm no longer cute. As if a silverback could ever be cute. Moonlight falls on the frozen carousel, on the silent popcorn stand, on the stall of leather belts that smell like long gone cows. Long gone cows, excuse me. The heavy work of Stella's breathing sounds like the wind and trees. I wait for sleep to find me. The Beetle. Matt gives me a new black crayon and a fresh pile of paper. It's time to work again. I smell the crayon, roll it in my hands, press the sharp point against my palm. There's nothing I love more than a new crayon. I search my domain for something to draw. What is black? An old banana peel would work, but I've eaten them all. Not tag is brown. My little pool is blue. The yogurt raisin I'm saving for this afternoon is white, at least on the outside. Something moves in the corner. I'm going to look back to the glossary for not tag. I don't remember what that was. Oh, it's the stuffed animal, isn't it? Stuffed toy gorilla. Tag was his twin sister. There we go. I have a visitor. A shiny beetle has stopped by. Bugs often wander through my domain on their way to somewhere else. Hello, beetle, I say. He freezes, silent. Bugs never want to chat. The beetle's an attractive bug with a body like a glossy nut. He's black as a, sti as a starless night. That's it. I'll draw him. It's hard making a picture of something new. I don't get the chance that often. But I try. I look at the beetle, who's being kind enough not to move, then back at my paper. I draw his body, his legs, his little antenna, his sour expression. I'm lucky. The beetle stays, the beetle stays all day. Usually bugs don't linger when they visit. I'm beginning to wonder if he's feeling all right. Bob, who know Bob, who's been known to to munch on bugs from time to time, offers to eat him. I tell Bob that won't be necessary. I'm just finishing my last picture. When Mac returns, George and Julia are met with him. Are with him, sorry. Mac enters my domain and picks up a drawing. What the heck is this? he asks. Beats me what Ivan thinks he's drawing. This is a picture of nothing, a big black nothing. Julia is standing just outside my domain. Can I see, she asks. Mac holds my picture up to the window. Julia tilts her head. She squeezes one eye shut. Then she opens her eye and scans my domain. I know, she exclaims. It's a beetle. See that beetle over there by Ivan's pool? Man, I just sprayed this place for bugs. Mac walks over to the beetle and lifts his foot. Before Mac can stomp, the beetle skitters away, disappearing through a crack in the wall. Mac turns back to my drawings. So you figure this is a beetle, huh? If you say so, kid. Oh, that's a beetle for sure, Julia says, smiling at me. I know a beetle when I see one. It's nice, I think, having a fellow artist around. Change. 
Stella is the first to notice the change, but soon we all feel it. A new animal is coming to the Big Top Mall. How do we know this? Because we listen, we watch, and most of all, we sniff the air. Humans always smell odd when change is in the air, like rotten meat with a hint of papaya. Guessing. Bob fears our new neighbor will be a giant cat with slitted eyes and a coiled tail. But Stella says a truck will arrive this afternoon carrying a baby elephant. How do you know, I ask. I sample the, I sample the air, but all I smell is caramel corn. I love caramel corn. I can hear her, Stella says. She's crying for her mother. Oh, gosh. I listen. I hear the cars charging past. I hear the snore of the sun. Bears in their wire domain. But I don't hear any elephants. You're just hoping, I say. Stella closes her eyes. No, she said softly. Not hoping. Not at all. Jambo. My TV is off, so while we wait for, their new, for the new neighbor, I ask Stella to tell us a story. Stella rubs her right foot, her right front foot against the wall. Her foot is swollen again and ugly deep red. If you're not feeling well, Stella, I say, you could take a nap and tell us a story later. I'm fine, she says, and she, sh she carefully shifts her weight. Tell us the Jambo story, I say. It's our favorite. It's a favorite of mine, but I don't think Bob has ever heard it. Because she remembers everything, Stella knows many stories. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings, but any story will do. Oh, I love the way he described that story. Let's read that again. I like colorful tales with black beginnings and stormy middles and cloudless blue sky endings, but any story will do. Black beginnings, that one's throwing me off, but like the stormy middle pop problems, right? And then the cloudless blue sky, like ugh, good endings, right? Happy endings. I'm not in a position to be picky. Once upon a time, Stella begins, there was a human boy. He was visiting a gorilla family at a place called a zoo. What's a zoo, Bob asks. He's a street smart dog, but there's much he hasn't seen. A good zoo, Stella says, is a large domain, a wild cage, a safe place to be. It has room to roam and humans who don't hurt. She pauses, considering her words. A good zoo is how humans make amends. Stella moves a bit, groaning softly. The boy stood on a wall. She continues, watching, pointing, but he lost his balance and fell into the wild cage. Humans are clumsy, I interrupt. If only they would knuckle walk. They wouldn't topple so often. Stella nods. A good point, Ivan. In any case, the boy lay in a motionless heap while the humans gasped and cried. The silverback, whose name was Jambo, examined the boy, as was his duty, while his troop watched from a safe distance. Jambo stroked the child gently. He smelled the boy's pain, and then, then he stood watch. When the boy awoke, the humans cried out, Stay still! Don't move! Because they were certain, humans are always certain about things, that Jambo would crush the boy's life from him. The boy moaned. The crowd waited, hushed, expecting the worst. Jambo led his troop away. Men came down on ropes and whisked the child to waiting arms. Was the boy all right, Bob asked? He wasn't hurt, Stella says, although I wouldn't be surprised if his parents hugged him many times that night in between their scoldings. Bob, who has been chewing his tail, pauses, tilting his head. Is that a true story? I always tell the truth, Stella replies, although I sometimes confuse the facts. Lucky. I've heard the Jambo story many times. Stella says that humans found it odd that the huge silverback didn't kill the boy. Why, I wonder, was that so surprising? The boy was young, scared, alone. He was, after all, just another grade eight. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. Ivan, he says, why aren't you and Stella in a zoo? I look at Stella. She looks at me. She smiles sadly with her eyes, just a little, the way only elephants can do. Just lucky, I guess, she says. Arrival. The new neighbor arrives after the four o'clock show. 
When the truck comes lumbering toward the parking lot, Bob scampers over to inform us. Bob always knows what's happening. He's a useful friend to have, especially when you can't leave your domain. With a groan, Mac lifts the sliding metal door near, metal door near the food court, the place where deliveries are made. A big white truck is backing up to the door, belching smoke. When the driver opens the truck, I know that Stella is right. A baby elephant is inside. I see her trunk poking out from the blackness. I'm glad for Stella, but when I glance at her, I see she is not glad at all. Stand back, everyone, Mac yells. We've got a new arrival. This is Ruby, folks. 600 pounds of fun to save our sorry butts. This gal is going to sell us some tickets. Mac and two men climb into the black cave of the truck. We hear noise, scuffling, a word Mac uses when he's angry. Ruby makes a noise, too, like one of the little trumpets they set at the, sell at the gift store. Move, Mac says, but still there is no Ruby. Move, he says again. We haven't got all day. Inside her domain, Stella paces as much as she is able. Two steps one way, two steps the other. She slaps her trunk against rusty metal bars. She grumbles. Stella, I ask, did you hear the baby? Stella mutters something under her breath, a word she uses when she's angry. Relax, Stella, I say. It will be okay. Ivan, Stella says, it will never, ever be okay. And I know enough to stop talking. So that was um, page 70. So we're gonna get to seven. We're gonna we'll start seventy one tomorrow. Um, this book has me very captivated, and it has me very conflicted. As a little kid, there are so many times where you love to go see animals at the circus or so forth, and it's so sad listening to the perspective that Ivan and Stella have about being those animals. It's gonna be a interesting book for us. It's going to probably challenge some of our views about some of the things maybe we grew up loving. Um, we will get back on here, like I said, tomorrow, and we will keep reading. We've got quite a bit of this book to go, but we did a great chunk today. Thanks for sticking with me um, and listening to my dog whine in the background. So I'm going to go take her outside now, and I'll see you tomorrow back here on our YouTube channel.